The Man in the Bell by W. E. Aiton In my younger days, bell ringing was much more in fashion among the young men of our city than it is now. Nobody, I believe, practices it at present except the servants of the church, and the melody has been much injured in consequence. Some fifty years ago, about twenty of us who dwelt in the vicinity of the cathedral formed a club which used to ring every peal that was called for, and from continual practice and a rivalry which arose between us and the club attached to another steeple, and which tended considerably to sharpen our zeal, we became very Mozarts on our favourite instruments. But my bell-ringing practice was shortened by a singular accident which not only stopped my performance, but made even the sound of a bell terrible to my ears. One Sunday I went with another into the belfry to ring for noon prayers, but the second stroke we had pulled showed us that the clapper of the bell we were at was muffled. Someone had been buried that morning, and it had been prepared, of course, to ring a mournful note. We did not know of this, but the remedy was easy. Jack, said my companion, step up to the loft and cut off the hat for the way we had of muffling was by tying a piece of an old hat or of cloth, the former was preferred, to one side of the clapper, which deadened every second toll. I complied, and mounting into the belfry, crept as usual into the bell, where I began to cut away. The hat had been tied on in some more complicated manner than usual, and I was perhaps three or four minutes in getting it off, during which time my companion below was hastily called away by a message from his sweetheart, I believe, but that is not material to my story. The person who called him was a brother of the club, who, knowing that the time had come for ringing for service, and not thinking that any one was above, began to pull. At this moment I was just getting out, when I felt the bell moving. I guessed the reason at once. It was a moment of terror, but by a hasty and almost convulsive effort I succeeded in jumping down and throwing myself on the flat of my back under the bell. The room in which it was was little more than sufficient to contain it, the bottom of the bell coming within a couple of feet of the floor of lath. At that time I certainly was not so bulky as I am now, but as I lay it was within an inch of my face. I had not laid myself down a second when the ringing began. It was a dreadful situation. Over me swung an immense mass of metal, one touch of which would have crushed me to pieces. The floor under me was principally composed of crazy laths, and if they gave way, I was precipitated to the distance of about fifty feet upon a loft, which would, in all probability, have sunk under the impulse of my fall, and sent me to be dashed to atoms upon the marble floor of the chancel a hundred feet below. I remembered, for fear is quick in recollection, how a common clockwright about a month before had fallen and, bursting through the floors of the steeple, driven in the ceilings of the porch and even broken into the marble tombstone of a bishop who slept beneath. This was my first terror, but the ringing had not continued a minute before a more awful and immediate dread came on me. The deafening sound of the bells smote into my ears with a thunder which made me fear their drums would crack. There was not a fibre of my body it did not thrill through. It entered my very soul. Thought and reflection were almost utterly banished. I only retained the sensation of agonising terror. Every moment I saw the bell sweep within an inch of my face, and my eyes, I could not close them, though to look at the object was bitter as death, followed it instinctively in its oscillating progress until it came back again. It was in vain, I said to myself, that it could come no nearer at any future swing than it did at first. Every time it descended I endeavoured to shrink into the very floor to avoid being buried under the down-sweeping mass and then, reflecting on the danger of pressing too weightily on my frail support, would cower up again as far as I dared. At first my fears were mere matter of fact, 
I was afraid the pulleys above would give way and let the bell plunge on me. At another time, the possibility of the clapper being shot out in some sweep and dashing through my body as I'd seen a ramrod glide through a door flitted across my mind. The dread also, as I've already mentioned, of the crazy floor tormented me, but these soon gave way to fears not more unfounded, but more visionary and, of course, more tremendous. The roaring of the bell confused my intellect, and my fancy soon began to teem with all sorts of strange and terrifying ideas. The bell peeling above and opening its jaws with a hideous clamour seemed to me at one time a ravening monster raging to devour me, at another a whirlpool ready to suck me into its bellowing abyss. As I gazed on it, it assumed all shapes— it was a flying eagle, or rather a rock of the Arabian storytellers, clapping its wings and screaming over me. As I looked upwards into it, it would appear sometimes to lengthen into indefinite extent, or to be twisted at the end into the spiral folds of the tail of a flying dragon. Nor was the flaming breath or fiery glance of that fabled animal wanting to complete the picture. My eyes, inflamed, bloodshot and glaring, invested the supposed monster with a full proportion of unholy light. It would be endless were I to merely hint at all the fancies that possessed my mind. Every object that was hideous and roaring presented itself to my imagination. I often thought that I was in a hurricane at sea, and that the vessel in which I was embarked tossed under me with the most furious vehemence. The air, set in motion by the swinging of the bell, blew over me, nearly with a violence and more than the thunder of a tempest, and the floor seemed to reel under me as under a drunken man. But the most awful of all the ideas that seized on me were drawn from the supernatural. In the vast cavern of the bell, hideous faces appeared and glared down on me with terrifying frowns or with grinning mockery still more appalling. At last, the devil himself, accoutred as in the common description of the evil spirit, with hoof, horn and tail and eyes of infernal luster, made his appearance and called on me to curse God and worship him who was powerful to save me. This dread suggestion he uttered with the full-toned clangor of the bell. I had him within an inch of me, and I thought on the fate of the Santon Basisa. Strenuously and desperately I defied him, and bade him be gone. Reason then for a moment resumed her sway, but it was only to fill me with fresh terror, just as the lightning dispels the gloom that surrounds the benighted mariner, but to show him that his vessel is driving on a rock where she must inevitably be dashed to pieces. I found I was becoming delirious, and trembled lest reason should utterly desert me. This is at all times an agonizing thought, but it smote me then with tenfold agony. I feared lest, when utterly deprived of my senses, I should rise, to do which I was every moment tempted by that strange feeling which calls on a man whose head is dizzy from standing on the battlement of a lofty castle to precipitate himself from it, and then death would be instant and tremendous. When I thought of this, I became desperate. I caught the floor with a grasp which drove the blood from my nails, and I yelled with a cry of despair. I called for help, I prayed, I shouted, but all the efforts of my voice were, of course, drowned in the bell. As it passed over my mouth, it occasionally echoed my cries, which mixed not with its own sound, but preserved their distinct character. Perhaps this was but fancy. To me, I know, they then sounded as if they were the shouting, howling, or laughing of the fiends with which my imagination had peopled the gloomy cave which swung over me. You may accuse me of exaggerating my feelings, but I am not. Many a scene of dread have I since passed through, but they are nothing to the self-inflicted terrors of this half-hour. The ancients have doomed one of the damned in their Tartarus to lie under a rock 
which every moment seems to be descending to annihilate him, and an awful punishment it would be. But if to this you add a clamour as loud as if ten thousand furies were howling about you, a deafening uproar banishing reason and driving you to madness, you must allow that the bitterness of the pang was rendered more terrible. There is no man, firm as his nerves may be, who could retain his courage in this situation. In twenty minutes the ringing was done. Half of that time passed over me without power of computation. The other half appeared an age. When it ceased, I became gradually more quiet. But a new fear retained me. I knew that five minutes would elapse without ringing, but at the end of that short time the bell would be rung a second time for five minutes more. I could not calculate time. A minute and an hour were of equal duration. I feared to rise, lest the five minutes should have elapsed and the ringing be again commenced, in which case I should be crushed before I could escape against the walls or framework of the bell. I therefore still continued to lie down, cautiously shifting myself, however, with a careful gliding, so that my eye no longer looked into the hollow. This was of itself a considerable relief. The cessation of the noise had, in a great measure, the effect of stupefying me, for my attention being no longer occupied by the chimeras I had conjured up, began to flag. All that now distressed me was the constant expectation of the second ringing, for which, however, I settled myself with a kind of stupid resolution. I closed my eyes and clenched my teeth as firmly as if they were screwed in a vice. At last the dreaded moment came, and the first swing of the bell extorted a groan from me, as they say the most resolute victim screams at the sight of the rack to which he is for a second time destined. After this, however, I lay silent and lethargic, without a thought. Wrapped in the defensive armour of stupidity, I defied the bell and its intonations. When it ceased, I was roused a little by the hope of escape. I did not, however, decide on this step hastily, but, putting up my hand with the utmost caution, I touched the rim. Though the ringing had ceased, it still was tremulous from the sound, and shook under my hand, which instantly recoiled as from an electric jar. A quarter of an hour probably elapsed before I again dared to make the experiment, and then I found it at rest. I determined to lose no time, fearing that I might have delayed already too long, and that the bell for evening service would catch me. This dread stimulated me, and I slipped out with the utmost rapidity and arose. I stood, I suppose, for a minute, looking with silly wonder on the place of my imprisonment, penetrated with joy of escaping, but then rushed down the stony and irregular stair with the velocity of lightning and arrived in the bell-ringer's room. This was the last act I had power to accomplish. I leaned against the wall, motionless and deprived of thought, in which posture my companions found me when, in the course of a couple of hours, they returned to their occupation. They were shocked, as well they might, at the figure before them. The wind of the bell had excoriated my face, and my dim and stupefied eyes were fixed with a lacklustre gaze in my raw eyelids. My hands were torn and bleeding, my hair dishevelled, and my clothes tattered. They spoke to me, but I gave no answer. They shook me, but I remained insensible. They then became alarmed and hastened to remove me. He who had first gone up with me in the forenoon met them as they carried me through the churchyard, and through him, who was shocked at having in some measure occasioned the accident, the cause of my misfortune was discovered. I was put to bed at home, and remained for three days delirious, but gradually recovered my senses. You may be sure the bell formed a prominent topic of my ravings, and if I heard a peal, they were instantly increased to the utmost violence. Even when the delirium abated, 
My sleep was continually disturbed by imagined ringings, and my dreams were haunted by the fancies which almost maddened me while in the steeple. My friends removed me to a house in the country, which was sufficiently distant from any place of worship to save me from the apprehensions of hearing the church-going bell. For what Alexander Selkirk in Cooper's poem complained of as a misfortune was then to me as a blessing. Here I recovered, but even long after recovery, if a gale wafted the notes of appeal towards me, I started with nervous apprehension. I felt a Mahometan hatred to all the Bell tribe, and envied the subjects of the Commander of the Faithful the sonorous voice of their Muetzin. Time cured this, as it does the most of our follies, but even at the present day, if by chance my nerves be unstrung, some particular tones of the cathedral bell have power to surprise me and to a momentary start.